It's 1912. I'm in Eastbourne, and there's been a murder. The murder in today's show, on the surface, looked like a simple tragedy. The result, perhaps, of a domestic turmoil, or the financial ruin of a man who didn't want his family to suffer the sordid consequences of impecuniosity. There was no trial. The culprit had shot himself at the scene. An open and shut case, you might think. But as the inquest began to discover, all was not. As it first had appeared, Eastbourne. I'm here at the seaside, watching the actually quite choppy、uh, tide ebb and flow, if that's what it does, and tumble fairly violently here on this wonderful shingle beach. Eastbourne is the archetypal holiday resort. With its Victorian seaside pier, grand Georgian hotels, and a thriving town centre, it boasts a 1930s bandstand and two Napoleonic fortresses. Known colloquially as the Empress of Watering Places, this relaxing, calm, serene, and dare I say retiring town here, nestling at the foot of the South Downs, has had its fair share. Of horrific and quite brutal murders. I'm walking along Enis Road in Eastbourne in East Sussex. There's a house here at the junction of St Anne's Road that bears the scar of a terrible tragedy. Not a lot of people know its history, for although it was a murder, it's because the culprit took his own life. That there was no murder hunt, and therefore no sensational news coverage at the time. But if ever there was a classic case, this is it. In my car, opposite sits Johnny Johnson, author of Sussex Murders and a host of other true life murder stories. And it's it's thanks to his patient research and investigation that we know a lot more about this horrific incident. Well, this is an old Victorian house, quite substantial. We are looking at the front, but the side goes back a fair way. It's a substantial sort of, of Vic- late Victorian house, really. And one morning, a Monday morning, it was the nineteenth of August to be specific, in nineteen hundred and twelve. The house was on fire. The smoke was billowing from the from the windows, and the woman. You see the little. There's a flight of about half a dozen stairs at the front of the house.、Mm. There was a woman standing on the top of there, screaming, screaming for help. And when people came closer to her, you know, they saw the, the fire, but they couldn't quite make out what she was saying about her babies. And she was saying, "He's murdered my babies." And they noticed too that she had blood streaming down her neck, and of course the police came and the fire brigade came and were inside. Inside they found five bodies. They found three children and another woman, and here was this other corpse of a man who had clearly、um, committed suicide. The gun was in his hand; he shot himself. The woman standing on the stairs outside Number Fourteen, Enis Road, with blood down her neck, was Florence Paler. She had met the dead man in 1907, some five years previously. His name was Robert Hicks Murray, a captain in the Gordon Highlanders. His family was supposed to be quite well off. His late father had been a barrister, and so had his brother. Murray had asked Florence to live with him, and together they had two children. But Florence was concerned about this cohabitation, and had already been ostracised by her family because of it. Although it was the early 1900s, the Victorian values were still prevalent and highly adhered to. Living in sin was most definitely frowned upon. Murray had agreed to marriage. But Florence was unable to pin him down as to when. 
On the whole, though, it was, outwardly, a happy relationship. Murray doted on his children and took his common-law wife to the theatre. But there were alarm bells that perhaps Florence should have paid more attention to. Now, on, on two separate occasions, Murray had threatened to kill Florence if she meddled in his affairs. Murray was a very secretive person. He said, I will make a clean sweep for all of us. Now, he said that to her when she tried to find out more about his family and questioned him. What exactly did he mean by that? It was curious, though, thought Florence. I mean, here was a military man, one without any uniforms or paraphernalia associated with the army. He had no special papers delivered to his house. He didn't even have a military dress sword. She must have been very puzzled by this man. Why the secrecy? As time went on, more odd things started to concern Florence and added to the increasing mystery of this strange man. His military life took him away from home quite a bit as it was, but he was spending one night at home and then one night away. He'd always been teetotal, but as time progressed, he returned from his trips drunk. Then there were the instances of using false names when he took Florence and the children away for holidays. For example, they went to Hearn Bay for five weeks in July 1911 and rented a house there in the name of Morris. Morris, not Murray. But then he didn't stay the whole time, but whizzed off on the call of duty to command his troops, leaving his lover to fend for herself for several of those weeks alone with the kids. It was all very curious behaviour. In July 1912, they moved down to Eastbourne. They put their furniture into storage and took a house in Annington Road, this time masquerading under the name of Mr and Mrs Sterling. They stayed there for a month, with Murray visiting twice a week. Then he moved her into lodgings at 31 Whitley Road, where she stayed until the 17th of August, 1912. Florence was miserable the whole time she was there and wanted nothing more than to return to their home in London. She was also pregnant again. At about 11am on that Saturday, Murray arrived to collect Florence and the children and was supposed to take them back to London and home. But he simply informed her that he had more military business to attend to and that he would be back later. He disappeared again and he didn't return until the following afternoon on Sunday. Then they went down into the town and strolled along the seafront and had tea all very normal, all very happy families. So, finally they arrive at Eastbourne Station, ready to return to London. And then, quite out of the blue, Murray changes his mind. He said that he had a house which was lent to him by a Captain Mackey and that they were going to stay there the night. Florence was troubled by this. But you have to remember that these were the days when the husband had to be obeyed. One can only assume that Robert Hicks Murray was quite used to having his way. Florence conceded and reluctantly made her way with Murray and the children in tow to number 14, Innis Road. Now when she got here, she confessed she hated it. There was... There was something sinister and frightening about the house, and, and as I look at it now, I suppose it does look slightly, well, large, mysterious and daunting. Although, of course, in, in its day, it would have been fairly new. I mean, here we are looking at it now with the, with the absence of, uh, well, quite some, some years, some sort of 80, 85, 90 years have gone past. And so it would have looked 
a little bit uh, fresher, I guess. But to her who is used to living in smaller houses, this was quite a big and imposing building. And obviously there was something at the back of her mind, some intuition, something intuitive, that made her perhaps suspicious, but certainly fearful as to what might happen moving into this house. Florence, we know, as she said it at the inquest, was convinced that something awful was, in fact, going to happen. Now, I guess that could have been second sight. Perhaps, again, she should have heeded her natural instincts. It's also curious to note another couple of things, which I suppose only in retrospect has immense significance. Murray apparently the whole evening was anxious and agitated and preoccupied he was also according to Florence very irritated with his son which was definitely unusual for him he he doted on his kids he loved them to bits and spent hours with them and the whole evening whilst he was having supper his hands were shaking the whole time he was not his usual and relaxed confident self Looking around the big, lonely, desolate house, Florence wondered who the large perambulator she had discovered in the kitchen belonged to. Murray said that it was for Captain Mackey's son. And then there was the curious locked room. We can go everywhere in the house, Murray had announced, except in that room. Apparently, the family silver had been locked in there all very curious and soon we will realize the full horrific significance of that locked room it was six o'clock in the morning on monday the 19th of august 1912 enis road was full of commotion Number 14 had billowing smoke pouring out of its windows. A woman on the steps was screaming. Blood was on her neck from gunshot wounds. Florence had been right. There was something wrong. Something very wrong indeed. The fire brigade came with their horse-drawn tenders and put out the flames. Florence Paler was taken to the local vicarage and then to hospital. The police arrived and began the investigation. Chief Inspector Charlie Miles and Inspector Taylor from the Eastbourne Constabulary stepped into the now open doorway of what had once been a small locked bedroom. What they found once the smoke had cleared was a sad and macabre sight. Five bodies, burnt almost beyond recognition. There was a woman, fully dressed, apart from her shoes. There were three very young children, and a man whose body lay at the side of a bed, a revolver still in his hand, and blood oozing out of the gunshot wound in his head. A note was found at the crime scene. It read... Am absolutely ruined and have killed all dependent on me. Should like them all buried in one grave. God forgive me. Now let's start to unravel this mystery. The dead man, as we know, was Robert Hicks Murray. He had killed his two children by shooting them first at point-blank range and then setting fire to the room by dousing the place in petrol. But then there was a third child and a woman. Florence had survived more by luck than by design. Murray had tried to kill her also and had taken two shots at her, both piercing her neck, but by a miracle neither was lethal and she managed to escape. So who was the other woman and child and why were they brutally murdered? Surely they couldn't have been dependent upon him as well. And as no one else had arrived at the house once Florence and the kids had moved in from the night before, where had this other mother and child come from? Now, as the the inquest folded, more and more things 
seem to get revealed. You see, there's no trial, there's no trial, because there's nobody you can try no. this, these, this murder of four people. But there is an inquest, and it's at the inquest the tale um, does unfold. One of Florence's sisters, Beatty Vickery, is sent for from London. And here is where the plot thickens. For she easily identifies the second woman and child. Now, before we go any further, let's just roll back the clock a moment to mention another important fact, which came out during the inquest. Johnny Johnson again. In June 1910, um, Florence and Robert Hicks Murray were visited by Florence's sister, and she hadn't seen her for a long time, Edith. They were both young women, you know, they're, they're, both in their, they're both in their 20s. And um, this was the first time that Edith and Murray had met, but it was clear they were quite keen on each other, even at that meeting, and Florence had picked this up. But what Florence didn't pick up for some months was that in September of that year, her sister Edith and Robert Hicks Murray got married. Incredibly, Robert Hicks Murray had married one of Florence's sisters, Edith, behind Florence's back. He was leading a double life, married to one and then seeing the other, with neither aware of this incredible situation. Not only that, he had fathered children by both women. And the remarkable thing is this. Both women think that Robert Hicks Murray is an army officer, and he's not. And both women think that he is the son of a barrister, and that his brother's a barrister, and that other relatives are army officers, and that is not true either. And in fact, he's not a Scotsman, although for some reason or other he, he has pretended to have been a Scotsman. And the real crushing thing is, he isn't Robert Hicks Murray. That's not his name. It's an assumed name. His real name is Robert Henry Money, M-O-N-E-Y. Now, this is another mystery. He lived with these women. He made no money out of them. I don't understand what happened. I don't understand precisely why he suddenly went on this rampage of murder, but I think perhaps he felt the whole thing, the whole charade, was collapsing. Instead of just moving off and, you know, just disappearing, he decided to take them with him in the most appallingly selfish way. Truth is... He had owned a dairy in Kingston, and he'd sold it, and he had a bit of property as well. And he must have been living off those funds for these five years or so, four or five, five or six years, and keeping the two families. Yes. <laughs> I, wonder, I, wonder if, I wonder if he'd run out of cash and then was desperate. I can't understand it. Robert Hicks Murray, who, as you've heard, his real name was Robert Henry Money, it transpired had both women installed in Eastbourne in 1912. In fact, they lived very close to each other, about half a mile or so apart. They both had children, and they both would have strolled into town and spent the summer on the beach. Now, ordinarily, one might get away with this if the women didn't know each other, but these were sisters. Murray was playing an extremely dangerous game. The chances of them not bumping into each other must have been very slim, and yet somehow they didn't. If Florence's testimony at the inquest is to be believed, she absolutely had no idea that her sister Edith was living in Eastbourne. We truly do not know the motive for these dreadful and unnecessary killings. Murray was without doubt a strange and complicated man. He seemingly loved both his women and absolutely adored his children. If his suicide notice to be believed, he was on the verge of bankruptcy and ruin. He must have had it in his mind that there was little more to do than to make a clean break of it, as he had threatened once before to Florence, and then to save them from the persecution of the poorhouse and not being able to provide for them any more, he had decided to end it all. The house here in Innes Road didn't actually belong to a Captain Mackey. In fact, there was no such person. 
it was actually registered to Robert Hicks Murray. Edith, Murray and her child lived here. Murray then flipped back and forth between the two, pretending all the while to be a captain in the army. Totally fictitious. And then at some point, I don't know, either bad news or something which rattled him. Perhaps his business had failed, the money had run out. But for some reason or another, he decided he could no longer go on. At some time, on Saturday the 18th of August, 1912, Edith and her one-year-old daughter, Josephine, were shot and killed in the front bedroom by Robert Hicks Murray. The room was then locked up and Florence was fetched from Whitley Road on the pretense of returning to London. Murray then apparently changed his mind at the station and took them to Innis Road. You can go anywhere in the house but this bedroom, he said, murderously aware of what lay behind the door, and worse still, what was in his mind to do later. The perambulator that Florence found in the kitchen, of course, belonged to the dead woman upstairs. Throughout supper, Murray was irritable, and we now know why. He must have been summoning the nerve to carry out the second series of murders, or waiting for a sublime moment to do it. Of course he was preoccupied. Florence had sensed something evil and foreboding as soon as she stepped into 14 Innis Road, but had absolutely no idea what dreadful future lay in wait for her. At one o'clock in the morning, Florence awoke. Murray was up, moving about the house. He occasionally came in to see her, then retired again. Then, at five o'clock in the morning, Florence awoke to find Murray standing over her. He simply and quietly said, Come here. And as she moved forward, she was shot in the neck. Murray then walked over to the awakening children and cold-bloodedly murdered them. He shot them. They hadn't a chance. The bodies were then moved into the small bedroom. Florence quickly hid into a wardrobe. Petrol was flung about the place, and a fire started. Florence rushed to the stairs, where she witnessed her children's bodies engulfed in flames. Murray lunged at her and shot her once more, hitting her again in the neck. But fortunately, she staggered away into the smoke. But all this time, Florence was still unaware that in that room now engulfed in fire, was also not only her children, but the murdered corpses of her sister and niece. Then a final shot rang out, and Murray's lifeless body fell and crumpled to the floor. And so the tragedy ends here in Enis Road, in Eastbourne, in East Sussex. And yet there is a footnote to this story, which is a mystery all to itself, which happened some years previously. And we will explore that in the next murder show. Murder show.